start today's event, it's my great delight and honor to welcome His Excellency, mm -hmm. Dr. Banda al Hajjar. Dr. Hajjar became president of the Islamic Development Bank Group in October 2016. Uh, the bank, as you all all know, is based in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's a multilateral development bank that works to improve the lives of people by promoting social and economic development in its 57 member countries and in Muslim communities around the world. It's a very strong bank. It's received the highest credit ratings, AAA, from the world's ratings agencies. In that same year, when His Excellency became president of the bank, he also assumed chairmanship of the very important committee, which oversees, on behalf of the government of Saudi Arabia, the service to pilgrims and facilitates the performance of their rituals. That's a key role uh, of the bank. And of course, Dr. Hajar, in his role as chair, his additional role as chairperson of the MDBs, the multinational banks, president's meetings, has been hugely influential in leading the SGBDs campaigns amongst the 12 banks, such as the World Bank Group, IMF, IFC, African Asian, European Development Banks, and so on. But our time is short. We're, we're deeply honored to have His Excellency with us. Um, Your Excellency, may I hand over to you for this uh, today's event, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, George. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon. I am really so delighted uh, to share with you and celebrate, in fact, with you today the launch of the book uh, titled The Road to SDG in a fast changing world. Uh, it reflects the commitment of the Islamic Development Bank Group toward SDG at a time where the world as a whole and developing countries in particular are facing uh, huge and immense challenges. Uh, and these challenges are far beyond the capacity of any single country or institution to deal with, uh, including uh, uh, unemployment, uh, funding, uh, funding uh, gap, and the financing gap, uh, to achieve SDG, trade deficit, climate change, fragility, demographical change, inequality, migration, all these things. So in order to deal with all these challenges, the world needs really to de-globalize de and, and strengthen uh, multilateralism and uh, global cooperation. Uh, in fact, uh, when, uh, I, uh, when I assumed office uh, in October 2016, I made, uh, uh, I made a deep and comprehensive reading of the economic and social landscape of the, in the context of global and uh, regional uh, context. Uh, my objective was to identify the optimum uh, uh, business model for the ISTB to help our member countries to build resilient, diversified, and sustainable economies that are capable of attracting uh, foreign and domestic investment and creating jobs and fulfilling its commitment towards uh, SDG and uh, Paris uh, Accord on Climate Change and the bank. Uh, 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 article of agreement. Uh, uh, so by uh, after 100 uh, days, uh, we launched uh, the President Five Years Program uh, titled The Road to SDG in a Fast Changing World uh, Program. In fact, uh, uh, contains uh, the initiative that ISTP intended uh, to deliver in the following five uh, years. And uh, this program was released uh, as a book uh, in three ISTP languages, Arabic, English, and uh, French. When we look at the ISTP uh, map, uh, the economic and social map, we find our countries in four continents, Asia and Africa, Europe, uh, Latin America. And uh, the, the, the economy of these countries depends heavily on exporting uh, raw materials and hence jobs with it to industrial the countries, uh, public sectors and government dominate. In fact, uh, the, the, the economy and the role of private sector is modest and the role of even uh, the, the third sector or non-profit sector is near nil. 
uh, uh, when, when we find the contribution to the non-profit mm -hmm. sector in, in GDP in, in developing countries less than uh, 1% compared to the uh, around 6% in industrial countries. All these challenges, in fact, caused a lot of problems. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we see the all indicators uh, point uh, to the emergence of a new economic order and uh, world order and uh, featured by economic, social, financial decentralization and accelerated by protectionism and driven by uh, fast technologic technology. See the fourth industrial revolutions and all these things. Okay, to deal with all these challenges, we need to think differently. We need to work differently in order to get a different outcome. Because if we continue our work as usual, and uh, now about maybe 60 years of uh, development project in our uh, member countries, developing at least developed countries, in fact, uh, we cannot see really a breakthrough in this uh, project. So we have really to come up with something different. Uh, so this is why we come up with the new business model. Uh, we call it uh, how to make a, a market work for this, uh, for development. And uh, this model, in fact, uh, focus on, on uh, strengthening the competitiveness of our member countries in, in industries or sectors that have a competitive advantage and, and, uh, and trying to uh, also design uh, the value chain for these industries and connect this value chain, domestic value chain with the, internet, with the global value chain. By doing so, uh, by, uh, we, we established, in fact, uh, uh, a way that uh, the country can create jobs, can attract uh, foreign investment, can achieve SDGs. Uh, so we come up with this uh, new business model. We call it, uh, as I said, uh, market, uh, making market work for development uh, one five ten, which means that if we succeeded in uh, in investing one trillion dollars in five uh, major industries that our member countries have a competitive advantage, we will be able to create uh, ten million dollars, uh, ten million jobs in the fifty-seven member countries. Because today we we realize that if the year about ten million male and female entering the labor market uh, in the fifty-seven member countries, and by twenty thirty we will have about ninety million. Uh, entering this uh, the, the, the job uh, or the labor uh, market. So the, the role of the ISTP in this uh, new business model will not be limited or unique to the, to the uh, financier. It will, it, we will play the role of catalyst, guarantor, financier, partner, facilitator, uh, leveraging on the, on the, on the uh, our strength, like uh, uh, ISTP is AAA institution. We are uh, on the ground uh, for in, in 57 member countries. We have a, an excellent relationship with uh, non-member countries. Uh, so all these things uh, we have to leverage on that. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, th th this uh, transformation process, it reflects in uh, the, 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 the bright future for ISTP and for member countries, just because ISTP revived itself to, to become a proactive, agile to the need of our member countries instead of uh, receiving and processing a project here and there, we are now focusing on holistic solution and focusing on the real causes of the development rather than symptoms. When we talk about develop, uh, when we talk about unemployment, poverty and so on, in fact, we are talking about the symptoms. We are not really talking about the real causes of unemployment, so what are the real causes of the poverty. Then we have to focus on the structural, uh, uh, of the structure of all, all these countries and try to, to, to find solutions. So if we continue working as usual, 
we have, we will face uh, ourselves with two uh, two choices: either fragility or pr prosperity. So here we we, we we focus, of course, uh, also on, uh, on 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 four tracks in this model. For example, uh, value chain, science, technology, and innovation, Islamic finance. Uh, partnership, uh, we focus on many issues like uh, climate change uh, and others. So I will stop here just to give uh, the chance, George, to uh, our colleagues to for their intervention. And then I'm more than happy to receive any questions or comment at all. Thank you so much for Your Excellency, thank you so much. That was fascinating and a great introduction to this event. Um, I, I was meant to say up front that we we would like you to put questions from the audience into our uh, Q and A box, but we don't really have to ask that because they are filling up with questions immediately. And given some slight time constraints, what I'm going to suggest, Your Excellency, is that you're going to stay with us. And thank you very much for this for our panel. Um, we are now going to move over to um, and the panel will start in about 15 minutes' time. Um, we're now going to move to and I'm just going to move um, a thing in my screen here, which is getting this wrong, but uh, to welcome uh, Ms. Amina Mohammed, who's Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group. Before her appointment, Ms. Mohammed served as Minister of Environment of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, where she steered the country's efforts on climate action and on efforts to protect the natural environment. Amina first joined the UN in 2012 as Special Advisor to former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, was responsible for post-2015 development planning. She led the process that resulted in global agreement around the, the very important 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the creation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Amina Mohammed, welcome. Dr. Bandar al Hajar, President of the Islamic Development Bank, Excellencies, Distinguished Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you for this opportunity and for your commitment on our crucial journey to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Less than a decade remains to attain the SDGs. The pandemic has undone years of progress. Over the last year, around 120 million people were pushed into extreme poverty, with the ranks of the hungry growing by 100 million. Over 100 million children fell below minimum reading levels, compromising the recovery and narrowing windows to their futures. Climate change runs ahead with fury. The global mean temperature is now estimated at 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, perilously close to the 1.5 degrees Celsius upper limit of the Paris Agreement. And the worst impacts are in developing countries and among those already vulnerable. The SDGs agreed to by all nations still remain our best shared blueprint for the way forward. Collective action is essential to emerge from the pandemic and accelerate the transition to equity, sustainability and resilience. Islamic finance, channeling funding to the real economy, avoiding excessive speculation or leverage and promoting risk sharing can drive innovative and sustainable financing at scale and reinforce solidarity as a vital underpinning of international cooperation. Let me suggest several key objectives for investment. Accelerating equal access to and the efficient rollout of vaccines to end the pandemic. Reversing losses in education and in the advancement of gender equality. Ensuring robust universal social protection, building on the many initiatives launched in lower income countries during the pandemic. Hastening the transformations in energy, transport, food systems and in bridging, bridging the digital divide through financing and technological transfer that are essential to secure nature for us and our children, and crucially, ensuring these transitions are just in their outcomes for people. Islamic social financing mechanisms, such as Zakat, Wakaf, and Sukuk, can be pivotal to realizing all of these. The Islamic Development Bank is already showing the way forward. For example, in its support for Indonesia's sovereign green Sukuk issuance, with proceeds in excess of $2.75 billion, or in its partnership with the government of Cameroon in launching a pandemic financing facility. I welcome the ongoing international dialogue undertaken by the bank and the UN with global stakeholders, which seeks to leverage Islamic social financing mechanisms to achieve the SDGs. 
dynamic efforts are also being taken by the bank, the UN and the WHO Foundation and the Global Vaccine Alliance to launch a campaign focused on utilizing zakat and sadaqah for procurement of the COVID-19 vaccine. Experiences such as these can catalyze similar innovations across the world. Multilateralism, South-South and triangular cooperation are vital to the way forward and the United Nations stands ready to help. I congratulate His Excellency Dr. Bandar al Haja, President of the Islamic Development Bank, for his excellent leadership. Rest assured, the Islamic Development Bank and its partners can count on the United Nations as an ally as we aim to recover and build back better from this devastating and ongoing crisis. Thank you. Amina Mohammed, thank you very much indeed. We are indeed on a crucial journey. And some of those figures that you quoted, which we all know, but they're still horrifying to hear about poverty and hunger, uh, particularly amongst children and the climate challenge are deeply worrying and is part of the pur are part of the purpose of today's event and much else beside. Now, it's my great pleasure, huge pleasure, to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs um, from Columbia University, who barely needs introduction, but Professor Sachs, as you know, is Director of the Centre for Sustainable Development at Columbia, where he directed the Earth Institute from 2002 until 2016. Um, he is also Director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and a Commissioner um, of the UN Broadband Commission for Development. He's been advisor to three um, UN Secretaries General. He spent, as we all know, more than 20 years as a professor at Harvard University, his alma mater. And he has written numerous bestseller books. Most recently, I think, A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism, published three years ago. Uh, professor Sachs was twice named as Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders. And far more importantly, was ranked by The Economist, where I used to be a journalist, among the top three most influential living economists. I think some of us there would regard him as being the top of that very elite group of top three. Professor Sachs, welcome and thank you for joining us today. George, thank you very, very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum uh, and uh, greetings to friends and especially congratulations to Dr. Bandar Al Hajar with your excellent leadership uh, of the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, you have really contributed magnificently to global progress, global solidarity, achievement of the sustainable development goals. And you've put the bank uh, into absolutely the front ranks of creativity uh, in new approaches to achieve sustainable development. Uh, it's been my enormous honor and pleasure to uh, meet with you uh, over the years and to uh, listen to you and to learn from you uh, about uh, the ways forward uh, globally. The role of the bank is of uh, exceptional importance, uh, of course, with uh, your 57 member countries, uh, 1.9 billion people, one fourth of the world's population. Uh, how could it be anything else but uh, the uh, Islamic Development Bank uh, in the forefront uh, of uh, support for such a, a huge part of humanity uh, to achieve uh, the future that we want. Uh, Amina Mohammed uh, just put it in very straightforward uh, and uh, important terms. We need investment. This is the basic word for the path out of this crisis and the way forward to sustainable development. Of course, we need investment in a variety of areas, uh, in people themselves, first and foremost, in our children, in their education and their skills, uh, in their healthful upbringing, their nutrition. We need investment in uh, health services, obviously, in the capacity of all regions of the world to produce vaccines and uh, uh, diagnostics uh, and uh, medicines. This is not the last of the pandemics that we're going to confront. And we have seen the power of science, but we have also seen how uneven uh, the uh, ability to harness that science is around the world and how 
it is the sad fact that no country, no region can depend on the goodwill of others in a world where there is often a scramble for uh, urgently needed commodities. Each region needs a capacity to produce uh, and to be in the forefront of the necessary science and technology. We need a new infrastructure globally. This is uh, clear and extremely pertinent, uh, of course, for many, many of the countries uh, that are the members of the Islamic Development Bank, because we are going to be shifting from the fossil fuel age to uh, the uh, zero carbon age. We are on a path of decarbonization. Uh, many members are among the leaders of uh, the hydrocarbon uh, industries uh, of the world. Uh, but many, many members uh, of uh, uh, the Islamic Development Bank have the potential to be superpowers in green energy uh, with some of the best sunshine uh, and uh, best opportunities to tap uh, solar energy, uh, wind power, geothermal uh, power, uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, in other words, the member states are a vast storehouse of zero carbon energy to be tapped. And we need investments, uh, obviously, everywhere to overcome the digital divide in a world that was moving to a, a digital world and then suddenly hurtled to a digital world uh, during the pandemic, where we have shifted our lives online. but with the implication that the half of the world that is not on the internet right now has been left even farther behind, unable to access the most basic services or help from government because all of this has been digitized. So we're in a period where investment is paramount. And I want to emphasize that in the years going forward, the role of the Islamic Development Bank and partner institutions, the other regional development banks in the World Bank, will be the central institutions for enabling the world to achieve sustainable development. Yes, there is a lot of capital uh, in the, the private capital markets, but this private capital must be harnessed for development finance. It must be harnessed for investment in people. It must be harnessed for investment in infrastructure. And therefore, I believe that it will be on the balance sheets of the multilateral development banks where we will find the most powerful investments in the coming years to achieve sustainable development. I'm advocating that we have uh, approximately a tenfold increase of financing through the multilateral development banks in the years ahead. I regard this pandemic as a basic watershed for the world, as decisive and important as was 1945 when the Bretton Woods institutions were created and the UN was created. We need to think in a new way as President Hajar just said, and that will require massive investments in the areas that I've indicated, but in a holistic framework as the president emphasized, and that means through the balance sheets of the multilateral development banks. I'm hoping that we could use the coming year, not only to end the pandemic, but also to upscale and reorient global development finance. Uh, next year's G20 will be in one of your important member countries in Indonesia. Indonesia will be uh, the presidency uh, of the G20. And I hope that by the time we reach the Bali summit uh, towards the end of 2022, we have a global understanding of the need for a massive upscaling of access to low cost, low interest finance. And a lot of it could be Islamic finance through the powerful tools of Sukuk, uh, Zakat and others, so that the developing world has the means to make the breakthrough to a safe, 
science-based, technology-based, modernized infrastructure for a green and digital future. Uh, and I hope we could work together in the coming year for that decisive breakthrough. Let me uh, thank you again, uh, President uh, Bandar al-Hajjar, for your phenomenal leadership. Let me thank the Islamic Development Bank for its creativity and its boldness and bringing uh, the wonders of Islamic finance to the whole world so that we learn and understand and are able to apply these lessons. We have a finance challenge. Let's take it up and make sure that we really have the decade of development that has been called for, the decade of action that will be decisive. Thank you so much for the chance to be with you today. Professor Sachs, it's, it's for us to thank you for this great contribution. Look, I know you're very tight for time and you have to be somewhere else in about 30 seconds, but do you think, given that the, even before the pandemic, very few countries were on track to deliver the SDGs by 2030, do you think with the efforts being made in the next year, we can genuinely do it or get near it? And, and how far behind are we? That question comes from me, an eternal optimist, but... Well, let, let me say that we saw in the last year a remarkable mobilization of finance, but it all went to the rich countries. The IMF showed last week that $17 trillion for COVID response were uh, mobilized by the advanced countries, but for the emerging economies, under $4 trillion, and for the low-income developing countries, that's a category of 57 countries, many of them by uh, Islamic Development Bank members, it was under $2 trillion. So what we learned, George, in the last year, there's plenty of finance at very low interest, but it's not being allocated to the billions of people that need it. And that's where the multilateral development banks have to play a decisive role and where we need to show to governments all over the world that for a small amount of paid in capital, they can leverage vast amounts of new lending that will finance the kind of future that we're looking for. Professor Sachs, thank you very much. I'm sorry to run over my time with you, but this has been great. We must tempt you back to our screens very soon. Anytime, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd now like to invite our panel, um, led by um, His Excellency, to the screen. I'm going to ask His Excellency in a moment, uh, based on what Professor Sachs just said, what can others, the multinational, multilateral development banks and um, other organizations, particularly financial, financial institutions, learn from what ISBDB has done during his time there and what his colleagues have achieved? But can I welcome to our screens now, if the technology works in this way, um, Dame Susan Rice, um, Chairman of the Jeffy Global Siri Group, um, Professor Ismail Sarageldin, I will introduce them all properly when they begin to speak. Professor Sarageldin is founding director of the Biblioteca Alexandrina, Latin for the new library of Alexandria, and a bit more Latin, delighted to welcome our good friend Stella Cox. Um, Stella um, is the Latin for star, as we know, uh, from DD Capital, uh, one of the great leaders of the UK financial uh, Islamic finance uh, industry. But Your Excellency, may I start by asking you what sort of lessons you think others, particularly the MDBs, can learn from the great work that you and colleagues have done in the past five years and, and which uh, Professor Sachs has just rightly praised? In fact, uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we have really to think differently because doing the same thing uh, more than uh, repeating the same thing will uh, not give us a different uh, outcome. This is uh, definitely uh, true. But uh, when uh, Professor Jeffrey uh, mentioned that and uh, uh, Amina about the, the need, we need uh, to in investment in everything. In fact, uh, the problem is not with the investment. Uh, the, the, the money there in the capital market, capital market, uh, the global capital market has a more than $300 trillion waiting for investment. The point is how to help our member countries to create the enabling environment that attract the private sector. And also we need to expand our partnership. Instead of focusing on PBs, public-private partnership, we should expand it to five Ps which is public-private philanthropist people partnership. We got to engage everyone 
in the development process in order to ensure the the impact uh, on the on the on the ground. So this this is uh, this is uh, very very important. We need also to uh, to 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 make a shift in a paradigm shift in the in the, in the development. Uh, uh, this is also very important in order to, uh, to ensure the impact of each dollar on, 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 uh, made in the, in the development. So this is very, uh, in addition to that, in fact, uh, we, we have to, uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, for example, Islamic finance and green support and science, technology and innovation, for instance, we need uh, all these problems. It needs an innovative uh, way of thinking. And this is why the ISTB is the only MDP that created a fund with $500 million, and we call it Transform Fund, to encourage uh, the, the, the innovators, the small businesses, universities, and others to to uh, to participate and uh, and uh, and uh, provide uh, so, uh, scientific solution to the development uh, problems, and we try to to help our member countries to to establish uh, the whole STI eco ecosystem because the, the gap now between the developing countries and industrial countries is very big and it is widening in, in, in terms of innovation and solution. And this is, if we look at the innovation as a, a driving force for, for economic growth and job creation. So here in our member countries, the, that those young male and females who are the talented, they, they are really, they don't have an access to, to risk capital. So how we, are, how we are going to link the risk capital to the growth and innovation in order to make, a, make, it, uh, make access to, to that. With regard to the Islamic finance, uh, it is very important really to look at the, the principle of Islamic finance are not really unique or limited to the Islamic faith. Uh, they're, they're, they, they are shared with the major uh, uh, religions across the globe and the basic principles are, are universities are uh, universal and can be shared even if they are, if they were not uh, labeled as Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic finance. Uh, so, uh, and in this context, for instance, when you take a Great Britain, uh, see, for example, the, the UK is uh, was well, the first uh, non-Muslim countries to, share, to, to issue Sukuk in 2014. And it has five full-fledged Islamic banks and 12 uh, the others that they have Islamic, uh, they provide Islamic uh, product uh, through Windows. And it is a hub also for the, uh, Sharia compliant insurance uh, company, the Kaful, and also the asset managers and big, uh, big uh, 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 consulting Islamic firms. In addition to that, the ISTP organized the first, uh, uh, first Sukuk summit in, 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 in Great Britain, in, uh, in, uh, uh, and the second one was uh, in Luxembourg. So, so these uh, issues, we have really to look at it in a holistic uh, way on, 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 on solution. But the main important thing is to be proactive and to, to try to help our member countries in, in sectors that they have a competitive advantage, not to finance fragmented project here and there. And we have to really to get out of the comfort zone that we used to to be there, uh, always people talking about uh, thinking out of the box, but at the, at the same time, they enjoy being inside the box. Excellency, thank you very much indeed. We've had an intriguing comment from our good friend Guy Job, uh, great global corporate governance and stewardship guru, who says, powerful contribution by Professor Sachs, an interesting approach to getting a fairer allocation of capital to achieve sustainable development globally. 
as says Guy, uh, is the pragmatic response by His Excellency you. May I now bring in um, Dame Susan uh, to bring her awareness and deep knowledge of, of banking. Um, I, my screen is playing up here, but Dame Susan, as I mentioned earlier, is chair of the, the Jeffy Global Steering Group, uh, and she is a chartered banker. Uh, she chairs the Financial Services Culture Board um, and was founding chair of the Chartered Bankers Professional Standards Board. She also chairs Scottish Water Business Stream and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And she's a director of a number of other uh, mainstream business and financial organisations. She was the first woman to head a UK clearing bank. She was chief exec and chairman of Lloyd's TSB Scotland, then managing director of Lloyd's Banking Group. Uh, so great experience in banking. And she was previously a non-executive director of the Bank of England and of energy company SSE. And she's helped to develop approaches to social finance in both the US and the UK and led a great deal of work on cultural and ethical standards for bankers. And quite importantly for this, very importantly for this, she chaired Scotland's 2020 uh, climate group. And she's worked in New York. She's been a dean at Yale and Colgate universities. I'll stop there. She's a published medical researcher. Can we come back to this issue of mainstream finance? What are they? How is mainstream finance moving, Dame Susan, in terms of understanding and achieving, more importantly, the sort of sustainable development goals? And welcome. Thank you very much, uh, George. And I'm really delighted to be part of this panel. Um, if we talk about financial institutions today, mainstream finance, I think we have to start today with the concept of purpose. And actually for me, that means starting with the SDGs. The Global Ethical Finance Initiative, Jeffy, is an organization devoted to unlocking finance to achieve the SDGs. And this focus, this thread runs through all of our work from campaigns to events, to reports, which we've worked on, for instance, with the UK Islamic Finance Council and others. I'll come back to this work in a minute, however, after I say something about the sector more generally. Over the last perhaps 10 years or so, the finance sector has been nudged into coming to grips with the purpose of finance overall and how that purpose plays out for individual institutions. Many firms have moved beyond the standard corporate messages and have been finding ways to understand what really goes on in their organizations and how they can genuinely achieve what they say they'd like to achieve, not through words, but in actions. Like Jeffy, an increasing number of firms have found the SDGs to be a vitally important tool it can be difficult to know where to start when you begin to think about purpose in an industry such as finance, because we're so used to thinking about risk and return. And while you want to do the right thing, it's often hard to know what should be the highest priority, what's most important, not just to your stakeholders, but to society at large. The SDGs are remarkable in that they've been developed collaboratively, as we know, by people from around the world who collectively arrived at the set of goals and priorities and their associated metrics and measures. I mean, how often does that happen? And they provide not just a common suite of goals, but what I call a common language for all of us to use, which I think has been particularly helpful for financial institutions, because it means that organizations can think about things outside of their comfort zone, outside of today's expectations, but in a reasonably structured way, in a way that feels legitimate. They can look at the SDGs and ask, how can we have the most impact on what society needs and society's goals, rather than having to do all the work of figuring out those goals from the beginning? And they can start at the outside and bring that guidance into their organizations. It's also interesting to me that more and more countries are aligning national performance frameworks to the SDGs. For instance, we've done that here in Scotland, where I live. This leads to greater scope for collaboration between public and private sectors. And again, the common understanding, the common language of the SDGs comes into play. Here in the UK, a number of financial institutions have also taken the bold step to consider the culture within their organizations through an outside in benchmarked approach. They work with the Financial Services Culture Board, the FSCB you mentioned, to provide an independent data-led view of how things happen in an institution, how decisions are made, what judgments are used. And this is important because contributing to the SDGs isn't and can't be about an exercise in corporate communication or ticking boxes. 
It's about the decisions taken and the judgments made by every member of staff within an organization, and also how that organization is doing in relation to other institutions, because it should be about raising their game all the time. So let me then come back to Jeffy. Recognizing the enormous potential the SDGs have to guide finance as it seeks to serve society better. At Jeffy, we've worked tirelessly to promote the SDGs within the finance sector. We've done this through campaigns as a stakeholder endorser of the UN Principles for Responsible Banking, which of course incorporate the goals. And on our own Path to COP26 campaign, uh, which has been going on for, I think, over a year now, ahead of the Glasgow Summit this November, we're devoting time towards examining faith in the context of the SDGs, which, of course, this event is about, alongside considering nature and net zero and other key SDGs. We've supported the UK IFC's Islamic Finance and SDGs Tax Task Force. We've done some of this through hosting events, numerous events, in fact, including a dedicated session on financing the SDGs at our recent Ethical Finance 2021 Summit at the beginning of the summer. Now, as much of what we do is focused on climate, the SDGs relating to the environment are important in that regard, but climate and society can't really be teased apart. We found the SDGs to be an important tool for looking beyond climate, as in the S in our recent ESG session in June, where we considered social finance. Finally, as well as events and campaigns, the SDGs have featured prominently in reports that we've worked on, uh, again, particularly with the UK IFC, where we've supported the work on Islamic finance and the SDGs. And another of our reports recently looked at ethical policies for the new Scottish National Investment Bank. In addition, we've been campaigning on interfaith finance with our Edinburgh Finance Declaration. The initial report demonstrated the common ground between the Christian and Muslim faiths relating to values in finance, and a follow-up showed how each of the six values we identified aligned with the SDGs. The ability to translate these values into the SDGs makes it so much easier to show any business how it can practically incorporate them into their day-to-day -day work and align their activity with government and societal goals and thereby reflect and demonstrate their purpose, which is where I started. Thank you. Dame, Su Dame Susan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, tremendous. Can we return uh, later on to this question of the financing of the SDGs and particularly looking at the role of individuals through their investments, through their pension schemes and so on in uh, this very important part of the world. Can I turn now, though, to the, the theme of science and technology and in innovation, which we've touched on, His Excellency touched on at the beginning, um, and turn to Professor Sarah Gelden. Professor Ismail Sarah Gelden, as I said, was founding director of the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, uh, the new library in Alexandria, which started 20 years ago, roughly. He's currently emeritus librarian and a member of the board of trustees. Uh, he serves chair and a member of a number of advisory committees for academic research, scientific and international institutions, such as as co-chair of Nizami Gandhi International Center, and he's a patron of the International Science Council. Uh, Professor Sarah Gelden has held many international positions, including as vice president of World Bank from, I think, 1993 to 2000, Professor Sarah Gelden, and mm -hmm. he's received many awards from global bodies, and he's lectured widely all over, over the world. He delivered the highly prestigious Mandela Lecture in Johannesburg in 2011, mm -hmm. the Nexus Lecture in uh, the Netherlands the same year, and the keynote address, the first international summit of the book, which I'm very sorry I had to miss in Washington uh, nine years ago. And he's published over 100 books and monographs and over 500 papers on issues which are very important to this theme today of biotechnology, rural development, sustainability, and very importantly, the value of science to society. I should say that as well as degrees from Cairo University, uh, Professor Sachs, he, he has, like Professor Sachs, a master's and a PhD from Harvard and has over 40 honorary doctorates. The last not on the wall behind him because he's not at home, he's in Washington right now. Welcome, Professor Sarah Gelden. How significant is science, technology, and innovation in achieving the SDGs? Well, uh, they certainly are, and I would like to uh, uh, add uh, to this CV the most important uh, thing. I'm very honored 
to be a member of the Science Advisory Board of the Islamic Development Bank uh, under the leadership of His Excellency uh, Bandar al-Hajjar and the leadership of Dr. Hayat Sindi. And uh, we provide advice uh, to the Islamic Development Bank and to the Transform Fund. Now, the Transform Fund is very much about the possibility of the, the innovations in uh, science applications uh, in the member states uh, for dealing with a lot of issues, including health, for example. We just had a major round dealing with uh, uh, cancer uh, and women and so on. But uh, what we have to recognize is that uh, there are two kinds of issues that uh, we have to face if we are going to have a major impact on uh, climate change which is SDG 13, but is also really an overarching uh, issue. And hopefully in Scotland, you'll be meeting uh, for the COP later on this year. Uh, the key problem is that we are on a track to go to four degrees, four degrees, uh, plus or minus 3.7 to 5.2. We are not on track to reach the one, to stay in 1.5 or to reach uh, two degrees. And uh, when we hear a lot of the innovations and how renewables are taking more and more of the space, it's mostly in the electricity generating part. And that's only about 15% of the total consumption of energy of a country. Uh, uh, the rest of it is still very much dominated by fossil fuels. So Germany now has 41% uh, 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 of its uh, production so-called uh, in renewables but that's mostly for the electricity generating part. For the total consumption of Germany, it's still about 78% in terms of fossil fuel. And that means we have different kinds of things that will need a different kind of innovation, including the issues that uh, Dr. Hajar talked about when he said the paradigm shift, and he talked about moving from 3P to 5P, because we have huge you know, sunk investments whether it's in cement plants or in, or in, or in steel plants or whatever that really uh, uh, have a long maturity period and that consume a lot of, uh, of energy and are having uh, an impact where the innovations uh, will be required and financial innovation will be required. And the 5P partnerships that Dr. Hajar mentioned uh, will play, I think, a central role. Secondly, I think that uh, uh, we have heard from a number of people uh, about Islamic finance. And one of the factors of that is zakat. And zakat is really a, a wealth tax. And uh, because it's whatever has lasted for a full year, uh, definition of capital, and therefore it is not a, just a flowing income. The third part I would like to say is that scientific innovation has shown, uh, we used to talk in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, about appropriate technology for the poor countries. And that usually meant dumbing down whatever was being done in the advanced countries for uh, uh, the conditions in the poorer countries. Now that has changed. We saw how we went from almost 3% uh, uh, of the world having mobile phones to almost two thirds of the world having mobile phones today. And mobile phone is a very sophisticated piece of equipment. And it ties with all sorts of other possibilities, including GPS, including all sorts of things that can and could not be done. And the poor countries have shown in many cases how they can innovate in institutional arrangements that use these technologies, starting with the uh, uh, Grameen Bank and Grameen Phone in Bangladesh, We've seen M-Pesa banking in East Africa, uh, primarily in Kenya, but elsewhere as well. And uh, that shows that uh, the ability to promote the STI, the, the, the science, technology, and innovation that the Islamic Development Bank is doing is really on target. And I believe it will have a major impact, both in terms of applications, but also by involving the people in these innovations and in their own activities there, we will do extremely well. Last point I would like to, make, to say is that we talked about people having competitive advantage. Well, there's one thing that's almost always produced locally or very largely produced locally, and that is food. 
food in many countries. And yet we are facing very severe challenges in the agriculture sector and we need to move towards precision agriculture. And I'm happy to say that the Islamic Development Bank is also looking at that. That will be precision agriculture will enable the poorest countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where 95% uh, of, the, of the agriculture is rain fed. Uh, and we know we expect more variations. One year of, uh, of uh, drought and one year of flood is not going to be helpful for the very poor farmers there. We need to find a way to ensure that that food is significantly produced, that the supply lines are in place that the support mechanism from agricultural credit all the way to new seeds, all the way to precision agriculture is all feasible. And uh, again, that's where an initiative I think that the Islamic Bank is taking is also in addition to the STI uh, is also going to be very helpful. So we have a long way ahead of us, but uh, I think science will be there to help us through with new technologies as we move ahead towards zero uh, net emissions by 2050. Professor Sergel, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to return in a while, in a little while, to those issues you raised about uh, the practical applications of science and technology in the developing world, because it's one of the really fascinating themes in the book, which is how uh, technology is being used, linked to financing, of course, to achieve great results. And I'd also like to now, if I may, last but not least, to bring in Stella Cox. Um, Stella has worked in the Islamic financial marketplace for more than 30 years, and she can give us great guidance now, I think, on how, again, reflecting what the book is about, um, Islamic finance has got a key role to play in the SDGs. Stella, since um, the late 90s, has been managing director of DD Cap Group, um, and under her leadership, DD Cap has pioneered Sharia compliant intermediation services, and she's brought much automation to the industry, uh, serving clients and counterparties around the globe, both inside the firm and by investing in other uh, startup and scale up businesses, which is great. Um, DDCAP was one of the first Islamic financial sector firms to be awarded the Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI, signatory status, and Stella represents DDCAP in the Islamic Finance and UN, Sustain UN Sustainable Development Goals Task Force, which we mentioned earlier. The inaugural meeting of that took place in July last year, and that was convened, as we said earlier, by the UK IFC in partnership with UK government. Uh, in goodness, five, six, seven years ago, Stella was appointed chair of the Islamic Finance Market Advisory Group of City UK, which is the main financial services professional body championing UK-based financial and related professional services. And she won a CBE for her services, was given that by Her Majesty the Queen, so I should really call her Commander. Um, can I say on a personal note, Stella has been hugely helpful in our CISI Islamic Finance Qualification, which since we launched it 16 years ago, um, and where um, Stella contributed the Islamic Asset and Fund Management module and kept, has kept that and us generally up to date. This was something we launched with the Ecole Superior des Affaires in Lebanon. Um, she's been a huge help to our institute. But can we come again reflecting what's in, in the book, Stella, to the role of Islamic finance in achieving these SDGs? Thank you. Certainly. Well, first of all, thank you, George, for your extraordinarily generous introduction and for being such a gentleman as always and not pointing out how quickly and how rapidly my years are advancing nowadays, but, but thank you. And can I also add my thanks to the Islamic Development Bank for organizing this session with Jeffy and, and UK IFC. Uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here with everybody this afternoon. So having a look at the global opportunities and challenges for Islamic finance um, in five minutes or so, and I could probably talk for five hours, I'm a markets person. I work in, in transactional structuring and execution as, as my day job. Um, and so in responding to George, I'll probably pick up on a couple of questions that I've seen pop into the question line that are market specific and particularly talking about support. But the key tenets that underlie Islamic finance differentiate it from conventional financial practices. And they provide Islamic finance with a natural alignment actually to the SDG and to their targets. But until recently, Many will be surprised to know that there's relatively limited engagement by the global Islamic financial community with the SDGs, as well as with sustainable and ESG focused finance more broadly. 
And um, even in our nascent greens to cook market, the proportion of green to standard issuance is still a long way below that of the conventional market. And whilst there's growing demand for retail and SME focused SDG linked banking products, realignment of a conventional offering via a Sharia compliant product or structure is often not readily available. But within Islamic finance, we've been deliberating for some time about just how we move beyond Sharia compliance to consistently embody the requirements of Makassid al-Sharia. And those are the objectives and purpose that sit behind and substantiate our compliance and how we build those into our practices. SDG alignment certainly supports the tayyib or wholesome concept. And in turn, that substantiates um, the focus of Islamic financial products and services being for broader societal impact. The notion though of committing to an undertaking that would be tasked to rise to this challenge and deliver practical outcomes whilst accommodating many different perspectives and the priorities of a specialist industry sector that has an extending global footprint, but at the same time includes a great number of emerging economies has really proven to be quite disconcerting, not surprisingly. But at the same time, thought leaders and influencers within our industry have really been diligently exploring the nexus between Islamic financial market stipulations and practices, and also those of other responsible and sustainable financial market subsets. So the outcome of that debate has resulted in various Islamic financial sector initiatives, and amongst them has translated into the formation of the Global Islamic Finance and UN SDGs Task Force, and that launched in London um, last year. Already the task force has enjoyed notable success that's positively evidenced by cross-border expansion and even the launch of an overseas chapter by Pakistan with other key markets for Islamic finance in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, um, building their domestic stakeholder groups. But within the UK, we've been working collaboratively and proactively to provide thought leadership to colleagues at home and abroad, but we've also had to champion consistency and adoption of global best practice and standards where practicable within the Islamic financial sector's approach and the build of its framework to support sustainable and responsible financial practice that will be purposed to deliver against the requirements of the SDGs. So with Islamic financial assets forecast by the UK Islamic Finance Council to push towards $4 trillion next year, Islamic finance has started to demonstrate the innovations and financial engineering to support creation of new instruments and solutions that is going to attract and deploy capital to, to deliver towards those SDG objectives. Um, and His Excellency the President was, was, was remarking on that need for innovation. But as the demand for green assets has accelerated, uh, and I use green very broadly, across the conventional sector, it's also served to increase the appetite for greens to cook. And that appetite has been apparent, interestingly, not just from Sharia compliance investors, but also from conventional investors who are seeking to diversify their investments into the Sharia compliance space. Um, and that in turn is eliciting a response from Sharia compliant issuers who are seeking to diversify their own investor bases. So we have a circular situation. Initially, ESG focused Sharia compliant instruments tended to be quite siloed with focus on one of the three factors, but that's changing quite rapidly for us as well. So new financing programs are expanding and they're encompassing two or even all three factors. So within Islamic finance, our industry labeling is changing pretty quickly as well. Um, in June, 2020, I have to say that the Islamic Development Bank inspired our market with its first sustainability to cook. And when it came back in this year with a two and a half billion dollar benchmark sized issue, which I think was its largest benchmark um, so cook to date, um, it was an incredible progress. But then Malaysia also came to the market with its long awaited um, sovereign de debut um, so cook earlier this year. And it also aligned itself to a sustainable approach. And that so cook was the world's first dollar denominated sustainability so cook. And Malaysia was able to uplift its issuance target size of a billion dollars up to $1.3 billion. And that was driven uh, purely by market demand. And it's interesting that in Southeast Asia, there have been top down influences in the Islamic market and the capital market of proactive government policy and positive regulatory input from an early stage. And there's been a focus on sustainability support through various different government and, and financial regulatory initiatives to incorporate and align social impact and green outcomes within a single project. 
And, you know, really the pathfinder, we have to say there, in Malaysia in 2018 was HSBC Amana, which issued the world's first SDG targeted Sukuk. At 500 million ringgit, that was a landmark transaction. It was the first ever benchmark sustainable Sukuk issuance by a financial institution. And those proceeds were deployed in accordance with the HSBC SDG bomb framework, which was um, aligned to cover Sukuk as well. So Islamic finance has its own unique identity and an ethos that results from being a faith-based subset of responsible finance and investment. But the call to action for firms to contribute to the wider global movement to deliver positive impact and, and to achieve against the SDGs is one that we can't afford to ignore. And through the principles of Makassid al-Sharia, Islamic banks and financial institutions have most certainly moved beyond business activities that reflect considerations solely of prescriptive Sharia compliance. That will always prevail, it has to, it's, it's at the epicenter of, our, of, of what we are and our being, but it's expanded to um, considerations that encompass and reflect social and environmental impact considerations too. And responsible and sustainable financial practice is accelerating through a stage of transition that extends not just to the profiling of financing facilities, capital market instruments and investment products, but also to legal and regulatory requirements, because let's face it, those are rapidly propelling us wherever we are in the world from that situation of being voluntary into mandatory disclosure and also mandatory reporting. And although initially daunting too, perhaps Islamic financial sector firms will even have an advantage here, because as all Sharia compliant practitioners know, independent validation of substance over form is a business necessity for us in our sector, it really underpins the core governance of our industry sector with our review by our, by our Sharia supervisory authorities. So building out principles and standards of best practice to ensure a consistent approach across our financial products and services is certainly not new to us, but achieving commonality and consensus with other subsets of the global marketplace to deliver against a set of goals that are intended for us all is very much something new. So in conclusion, um, I'd suggest that the SDGs, which are known to us as the global goals as well, are just that. So they're a universal call to action intended for us all. Undoubtedly, the Islamic financial sector has the cap capacity to mobilize funds to address the five to seven trillion dollar annual funding gap that has to be satisfied if we're going to have any chance of achieving the, the goals 2030 target. And I've really focused on capital markets, but you know, others have already commented, and if questions allow us to, we can expand into the prospects of unlocking the huge potential to WAF as well. But um, linking the proceeds of Sharia compliant funding to projects and business activity that embody the targets and objectives of the SDGs are increasingly apparent, fortunately, in our sector's transactions, and not just within. Um, the ISDB's astonishing the cook issuance approach, which is world leading, but always recurring brings the cook issuance in Malaysia's groundbreaking sovereign sustainability support and an accelerating volume of capital markets issuance by SDG aligned corporates across the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Interestingly, a lot of those are taking those corporations through their own transitional process as they look to move, move towards a, a low carbon economy targets. So as we approach COP26 in November, through the combined efforts of our industry stakeholders and not least the task force, Islamic financial market firms and practitioners will and must continue to focus on the interconnectedness of the 17 SDGs and how this industry sector can accelerate, can accelerate our delivery towards achieving them. Sarah, thank you. A masterly overview as ever. I'd like to come back to you shortly to talk about some of the practical initiatives that you are taking inside DDCAP on this whole area. And Your Excellency, I'd like to turn to you in just under a minute on, on, on some of those practical initiatives which lie at the core of the excellent book that you've just published, which I would commend to everyone, um, and looking at the work you've already done at the Islamic Development Bank and uh, to consider looking at the issues around unlocking global private capital and heading it, directing it towards the SDGs. This is a stage during most webcasts when the person in my seat usually says, 
Um, if you'd like to ask some questions, please do, because we don't seem to have any, but we don't, uh, they don't say that. But in this case, we've got so many questions, we're going to have trouble covering, but we might try at the end and later on through LinkedIn and online and other mechanisms. But, but Excellency, we have you here. Can I ask you to develop perhaps a bit further than the book is able to cover in its excellent pages, um, highly recommended to everyone, um, some of those issues around the practical initiatives that you've started, you and your team have started in the past five years towards achieving the SDGs in what is now a tight time frame. Okay, uh, thank you. I just would like to uh, highlight the few points which has been uh, uh, highlighted in the, some of the intervention. First of all, with regard to the importance of STI in the new business model, as you know that we, we conducted a, new, uh, a comprehensive study to identify uh, five uh, major industries that our member countries have comparative advantage. But uh, as the world is entering the fourth industrial revolution now, uh, the, the question is how we are going to qualify these industries to the fourth industrial revolution. I give an example, for example, one of these industries is a textile. When we see the textile industry in Bangladesh, for instance, it hire about 5 billion people there. And the competition in this area is very strong, especially with China and other countries. So if we don't, if, if Bangladesh does not really uh, qualify this industry to the fourth industrial revolution. That means about five million people will they, they will lose their job. And if we see if every uh, worker is, uh, is, uh, has a family with five uh, individuals, that means we are talking about twenty-five uh, million. So here is the it comes to the the role of the of the STI to to qualify these industries through the call of innovation and how we can really uh, 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 strengthen the competitiveness of in the, in industry. With regard to the social Islamic finance, I do agree with uh, Sarah. We are, we, we, we are facing, of course, uh, the, the, the Islamic finance, uh, some difficulties and constraints, especially when it comes to harmonization, standardization, and this sometimes uh, make constraint on the, on, the, on the tools and mechanism of, of, the, of the market. And despite that, the, the, the value of this industry is about uh, $3 trillion, and this grows about 20% every year. But we need really to work more about, uh, on this thing. What is really, uh, it is important, which I am now working on, uh, I'm working on, on a paper that probably, uh, I am thinking of the importance of establishing uh, a multilateral social development bank uh, that uh, uh, help mobilizing resources for, from the uh, from Zakat, from uh, Sadaka, from philanthropist, uh, many sources, and then channeling them to the social uh, areas uh, that especially now in post COVID-19, it shows us when, it, when we talk about vaccine or the, the need and quality and rich and poor and all these things. I think it is time that uh, we, we have really to think of establishing a multilateral social development bank that uh, focus mainly on the social finance, especially now, as uh, some of our colleagues uh, here mentioned that uh, this pandemic, it, will, it is not the first, that will not be the, the, the last. Uh, and also we are talking about, uh, about, the, uh, about climate change and natural disasters. And our different countries, especially the least developed countries uh, with weak infrastructure, uh, and uh, with the heavy dependence on agriculture and tourism. When they are hit by, uh, by, by natural disaster, caused by climate change, they, this will cause more poverty and hunger and economic, social, and security problems. So this is, uh, the, 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 it, is not for, uh, it is not just uh, 
it needs economic solution or health solution, it needs social solution. And the, 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 unfortunately, the financial resources that are located to social aspect is uh, very minimal. So we need really to expand this sector. As I mentioned that the, the, the contribution of non-profit sector in our member countries is, is less than 1%. So always the, any economy, like in, in, in the West, you find very strong public uh, sector uh, with the very organized private sectors and also uh, the, the third sector and all of them, they complement each other. In developing countries, you either you find strong public sectors, weak private sectors and non to for the non-profit sector. So we have really, yeah, uh, if we establish such a bank, it will strengthen the, the social sector, the non-profit sector, which is really needed. Now, when we talk about vaccine, uh, if we have a strong non-profit sector, it will help to, to bridge this gap of the inequality between rich and country and poor country, and even on the, on the level of individual. So this is, uh, this is very important, really, to move to move forward and to learn a lesson learned from the, this pandemic to think about how we can, and, uh, and uh, when we think about how many foundations, philanthropic foundation in the world, especially in the Western countries and in which sectors, we find it in different sectors, that's huge. So how we can really leverage uh, this, how we can mobilize resources and united our effort under one umbrella, such a, a multilateral social development bank and move forward uh, towards these uh, issues because uh, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult that to focus on two sectors, uh, just public and, uh, uh, and private sectors. We got to engage, or to engage all these sectors. So I'm now working on producing such a paper and probably uh, we will expand the discussion with regard to this, but this is very important. Excellency, thank you very much, and we look forward to that paper. Can I come to Professor Ismail in a few minutes to address one specific thing that His Excellency raised, which was around natural disasters and the sort of resilience that uh, science and technology can offer to those at many different levels. But may I turn first of all to Dame, back to Dame Susan to talk about some issues around um, liberating private capital uh, to address some of the SDGs. We've, our members working in wealth and asset management, uh, the rather faster moving ones, find that a number of their clients are particularly keen to invest in areas um, through their pension funds and other mutual funds and direct investments in activities around health and education and agriculture and uh, renewables. They're all part of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, tartan. Um, I'm not selling ties, but I should promote this. Um, and can you do you have some thoughts on how we might help um, our members, for instance, and the whole community uh, trigger some of that quite large sum of money um, for the SDGs? Oh, so I think that's a really good question, um, George, for, for a number of reasons. Um, how often have we heard, certainly I've heard in conferences and meetings and so forth, people saying, oh, it's the younger generation that are interested in the SDGs. The younger generation is focused on ESG matters. But actually, and I've said this before, the younger generation gets older over time and they become us. And I think the reason your question is really important is that um, there are a lot of individuals or a lot of people who want to work with their investment managers and their investment advisors to um, invest funds in the ways you just described. Uh, and this is a big enough um, pool of people and a big enough pool of, of potential funds to require some real attention from asset managers. Uh, so I would just make that comment uh, to begin with. Um, another general comment is um, how interests change over time. So I think for a while, it's all been about the environment. It's been about the E and ESG uh, and still is in a very real way. But more recently, the S, the social aspect, uh, the people, um, how people um, are 
coping or not coping um, in, in, in parts of the world. The, the, the growing divide that we've all seen and spoken about, not just, but certainly exacerbated by the pandemic, but before that as well. Uh, and um, it is, I think, a real challenge to our asset managers, our investment management advisors, to come up with and design portfolios and find funds that will achieve something in these spaces. I would also say that um, the vocabulary here is a real challenge. We all use sustainable, we all say uh, responsible uh, investments and so forth, but we actually use those words meaning different things. Each of us often means something different by it. So it's important to have um, uh, sort of a good grasp of what it is we're interested in, what it is we care about and want to look for. Um, and at the end of the day, and I think this is really important, um, I think that the big factor here is time because you can invest in many things and get a return of whatever sort um, in a short period of time. And then you can see harm, damage, or the loss of that return over a longer period of time. So there is something about our investment management community, our financial advisors, helping guide individual investors to understand the importance of um, impacts that are not purely financial, uh, which is presumably what they are looking for, um, whether those impacts are real and genuine and are they lasting over time, because that's really when it matters. I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but it's some thoughts your question made me think of when you asked it. It, it does indeed. Thank you very much, Dame Susan. And certainly this question of time and patient investment is hugely important. Sitting here in Edinburgh, I know I know the importance of patient investment um, over many years. Professor Ismail, I've spent the past week here looking after small grandchildren and persuading them that it's not the falling over that matters, it's picking themselves up again. Um, so resilience, how can technology and science help with resilience against these natural disasters which will keep coming? Well, there is, uh, of course, uh, when you discuss something like uh, 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 water, uh, drought, rainfall, etc. There are different ways of doing that, not just huge dams, but small dams that can recharge the underwater aquifers, the underground aquifers that help people with their wells, uh, etc. But that is very location specific. So whatever we need to do, we need to have uh, proper uh, management at that level involving the local communities, involving the peoples themselves. The, in 2015, the world really made the major, major movement. The SDGs were approved, the Paris Accord was signed, and we also signed the Sendai Agreement, which is for disaster risk uh, reduction, and uh, which is all based around resilience. And uh, it is a way of assisting both with buffer stocks, with better distribution systems, with the reduction of waste, with a lot of other things that enable people to be able to survive what comes. But we have seen recently, believe it or not, and I think we're, we're talking with uh, Dr. Hajar and uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and so on, 49 degrees in Canada. In Canada, we had 49 degrees, uh, the whole Western part of the United States. You saw the floods in Germany, where it went up three, three stories high in no time. So the extreme weather events are not just uh, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa or parts of Brazil or so on. They are also in the industrialized countries. And I think this uh, awareness that uh, uh, things are moving much faster than we anticipated. Uh, we're not waiting to 2050. It's be extreme weather events are happening right now. And uh, I think that therefore the resilience part of that will be expanded in the near future. Uh, and uh, we have the mechanisms for a lot of that, but we still have to search for some of the bigger issues that I mentioned at the beginning, like the cement and steel plants and so on, because we still need them. And how are we going to deal with that uh, as opposed to uh, electricity generation? Uh, and maybe transport. So we have to look at, at some of these other uh, aspects as well. Science is there. In fact, it is only with science that we will be able to do this. Without the science, we will not be able to do it. Everybody talks about artificial intelligence and uh, ICT, but there is a real revolution in the new biology. I've had the privilege of working on several panels with 
the U.S. National Academy of Science and the American Academy on these issues. And, uh, and that revolution raises ethical questions and how you're going to deal with living organisms and so on. But at the same time, the mergers of the, the, the ICT and the new biology give us enormous opportunities to increase the resilience, not just of our crops, but of a lot of other things as well uh, for, from uh, health and medicine, uh, all the way to cleaning up and non-waste uh, and non-pollution. Uh, all of these are important parts of what we are facing and science and technology and innovation, which the Islamic Bank has been uh, uh, supporting through the Transform Fund is a central part of addressing that. Professor Ismail, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're, we're running out of time here, but so many of these theme, themes you could pick up and carry on for the rest of the day, but we must come back to many of them. But um, for now, Stella, may I turn to you finally? We've talked here about patience, we've talked about resilience, we've talked about community engagement. You are at DDCAP all three, maybe sometimes not completely patient when you want to achieve things, but <laughs> tell us a bit about, would you, about how you've approached the integration of SDGs into your sustainable and responsible actions commitment, please. Yeah, certainly. Well, I'm quite aware not everybody will be familiar with, with DDCAP, but we're a, a market intermediary and we work predominantly for wholesale banks, financial institutions within the Islamic financial sector. And we also develop automated solutions for their banking capital markets requirements as well. But in response to your question, George, we've aimed to be a first mover in our space. We try to lead by example. So we, like many others, are committed to developing a more sustainable, equitable and prosperous world. But we try to do that by connecting the Islamic financial marketplace responsibly. So we support the view that those in business um, must adopt strategies that go beyond just seeking purely and delivering financial results. And, and, and we try to achieve positive social and environmental outcomes. Um, this whole path for us really came after we made our own independent commitment to Sharia standards and established our own Sharia supervisory board back in 2013. And after that, we felt that for us, the natural next steps were to work towards best practice standards for sustainability and responsibility. And we took a gradual path to adopting that and we called it our SRA agenda, Sustainable and Responsible Actions. Um, and initiatives relevant to it have been formulated and approved at the highest levels of our leadership. But within the organization, we've really very much managed the message from the bottom up. And that's something that I think Dame Susan was, was talking about earlier, making sure that everybody is included in this. And so from inception to implementation, across two years, and we're a smaller organization, I know it can take others much longer. Um, policy was evolved, we looked at our documentation, we looked at sustainability screening, we particularly looked at Ethos AFP, which is our proprietary facilitation platform for our client transactions. And that is linked into commodity and physical assets, so we have to look closely at that. And we're also very privileged to be able to nominate within our Sharia Supervisory Board, an SRA champion, who's Dr. Mohammed Akram Laldin from Malaysia. Um, but the development of our SRA policy has been shaped externally by multinational initiatives to promote responsibility and sustainability, uh, and sustainability and increased awareness of ESG concerns, including the UN SDGs. Um, at DDCAP, we closely identified with the SDGs and, and we, we worked initially to um, identify those targets and objectives that were most relevant and align ourselves with them. But speaking from DDCAP's experience, there's a real valuable role that engagement with, multi with multinational initiatives can, um, can have in impacting the direction that an institution takes. So if you look at PRI and PRB, they call upon signatories to individually incorporate ESG issues into their analysis and decision-making and into policies and practices. And we have been a signatory to PRI since 2016, PRB more recently, 2020, but we also commit to promote industry and implementation of the principles and work together with those in our marketplace and others to enhance effectiveness and also to promote disclosure of our activities and their, and their progress. Um, where there has been engagement by the Islamic financial industry and its banks and institutions with the SDGs, um, it's very interesting that there's been a lot of commentary about, about 
about the S or, or social impact. And historically, I think in Islamic finance, we've been rather good at that part. And, and, and typically there's been less emphasis on environmental considerations or on initiatives like UMPRI or PRB, which support governance. And um, the UK Islamic Finance uh, SDG Task Force has been really important in expanding that work. And I think um, we've been engaging very closely with the SDG Task Force since it was incorporated last year, because it's been positioned to help address this disconnect um, with, with the other factors and to promote engagement with and adoption of the UN SDG by Islamic financial institutions globally. So the task force has established theme working groups, which at DDCAT we consider a vital in promoting and bringing industry awareness of the E and the G, particularly as we're leading in, as I said before in my opening remarks, to COP26 in November. So at DDCAT we've been strong supporters of those working groups and their objectives because through them, we can also help to create pathways for greater practical engagement by IFIs to support the development and acceleration of a more rounded contribution to industry, as well as enabling us to better understand actual and potential customer demands. And I know I saw some questions pop up about metrics that we really haven't covered, but for us, you know, in our industry, we're still looking at frameworks and principles and guidance and guidance notes. And actually the metrics are starting to build, but we need to form the foundation to do that. So by understanding those points better, in turn, it's helping us to educate customers and clients and highlight to the institutions that we work with where the demand for SDG linked financing actually is. So finally, returning to the S, um, as I said, Sharia compliant financial practice has a real long history of alignment with financing for social impact. And I think His Excellency's ideas about, about um, social banking are, 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 are really inspiring. Um, but in 2021, in this lead into COP26, there's been a conscious effort to embrace the opportunity to bring focus to the environment with firms, including DDCAT, looking as always at our, our individual impact, our collective impact, and how we can improve our footprint individually and collectively, assist our stakeholders and work together with like-minded organizations to do the same. As the SDG task force has developed, it's provided an important forum for that industry discussion and debate. Um, but it's also been inclusive of its observers and supporters. So although there are very many Islamic financial sector firms in attendance, we're not exclusively so. So that is very valuable because it enables us to contact, to contact, connect and share our experiences and best practices with a view to developing a more consistent approach across global finance to disclosure and reporting and that and, and an approach that will link Islamic financial institutions and banks into, into mainstream. Stella, as ever, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, there are many, many questions which have come in which we haven't been able to answer, but let us use those either to answer them directly and certainly to inform future coverage from the teams at UK IFC at Jeffy, and I'm sure that colleagues at ISDB will be looking at them as well. Can I thank you all for watching uh, this really great programme, which I've enjoyed as well as being honoured to, to moderate. Um, thank you for all the great questions. Thanks to the teams at Jeffy and at UK IFC for putting this all together and running the technology, and also to Dr Hayat and our colleagues at the Islamic Development Bank. But most of all, thank you to our great team of speakers, to Dame Susan, to, to Stella Cox, to Professor Ismail, uh, to Jeffrey Sachs earlier, and to Amina Mohammed. But most importantly, thank you for a great book and some great presentations from Dr Bandar al Hajar, His Excellency. And may I ask um, His Excellency, um, to uh, say some concluding words. And can I just add before you say that, that I mentioned Guy Job earlier, who, who is one of my great heroes in the world of finance and a friend. Um, and um, he has just said he's learned a lot, which from coming from Guy, Professor Guy Job, is, is a great compliment. It's been a wonderful event. Your Excellency, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, institutional transformation and uh, it, 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 it was really uh, supported uh, by the, uh, the board of governor of the bank, uh, the board of executive directors, our member countries, especially the host country, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
So to, to them all, I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation. And also I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, the staff at the bank really for their substantial contribution in, uh, in, uh, in making all this uh, initiative uh, from uh, conceptions to implementation. Uh, and I would like really to have this opportunity to express my heartfelt appreciation for your very active uh, participation in, in the road to, to STG webinar, especially special thanks to the Deputy Secretary General, Yoen Amina, and uh, to all panel speakers, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sack, uh, Tim Susan Rice, and Mrs. Stila Cox, uh, Professor Smail Srajaddin, for sharing their uh, knowledge to enrich uh, the subject uh, of the road to SDG. Also, I would like to thank uh, you, Mr. George, for uh, uh, really, uh, you did uh, an amazing job to moderate uh, this uh, webinar. Also, my uh, gratitude uh, to our uh, partner, a Global Ethical Finance uh, Initiative and Islamic Finance Council for uh, pulling this webinar together. And I would like also to give special thanks to Dr. Hayat Sindhi for organizing such high caliber event and for her uh, efforts and collaboration and contribution in this uh, webinar. Again, thank you very much for taking time from your busy schedule to be our guest speaker. And I'm also grateful for your willingness to share your crucial knowledge. Thank you so much and see you inshallah in other webinars. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much everyone for what a, a really great event. It's made my whole year excellent and we look forward to welcoming you back and we hope by that time you all have something appropriate in this great <laughs> tartan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. See you.